Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we're going to be talking about a solved case from Texas. Late one night in 1983, several people just mysteriously disappeared from a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant in Texas, leaving the authorities baffled as to what could have possibly happened to them. However, it wouldn't be long before they would find out when their bodies were discovered and it was determined that they'd been horrifically murdered, essentially execution style. But what would take a very long time, decades in fact, was for the truth surrounding who committed these murders to be revealed. The police had to wait for advancements in forensic technology to finally identify those responsible for this heinous crime. Join me as we delve into the shocking case of the Kilgore KFC massacre. But just before we get into the case, I would like to say a big thank you to Private Internet Access for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Private Internet Access is a VPN service, a virtual private networking service that helps to keep you safe online from hackers and those who may be looking to exploit your private information and they basically do this by hiding your IP address and safeguarding your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel. For me using a VPN is super important particularly when I'm out and about and I'm trying to use public Wi-Fi because you just don't know who else is connected to the same Wi-Fi network and could be trying to steal your personal information like your passwords. A VPN works by making it appear as though you are operating from another country and there are so many benefits to this besides just keeping your your online identity protected, such as being able to access content from all over the world. I personally use private internet access all the time to check out different countries' Netflix libraries because obviously they would have different movies and TV shows to watch compared to the UK Netflix. All you have to do is use the VPN to change your location and then you can access it and oh my god it is a game changer. You can also access YouTube videos that aren't available where you are. You can use it to access different Disney Plus libraries and Amazon Prime. In addition to that, I use private internet access so much when I'm working, when I'm researching for these videos. In fact, I used it whilst I was researching this case because this case is based in the US and that meant that a lot of the online articles were not available for me to read in my region. But I just changed my location to the US and hey presto, I could access them. So I guess you technically have private internet access to thank for this video. Private internet access is available to use on all platforms including Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, Linux and more and what's so great about them is that they allow you to protect an unlimited number of devices so you can essentially protect your entire household with just one subscription. And they are very kindly offering my lovely viewers an incredible discount of 83% off making it just $2.03 a month and you'll also get four months for free on top of that and they also have a 30 day month money back guarantee too. So the link to receive that offer will be at the top line of the description box. I highly recommend that you guys take advantage of it because I mean $2 a month is nothing is it to protect your online data. Thank you so much once again to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to all of you guys watching for always showing your support to the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. But just before we continue please listen carefully to the following. This video contains heavy themes such as rape and sexual assault. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back more than four decades now to the fall of 1983 in Kilgore which is a city located in Gregg and Russ counties in the state of Texas in the US. Described as being the kind of area where everyone knew everyone, Kilgore was a relatively small city back in the early 80s. A very friendly and wholesome place to live, really not the kind of place where you would expect such a horrific crime like this to take place. The date was the 23rd of September 1983. It was a Friday, so the end of the working week, and that Friday evening was a busy one in the Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant in Kilgore because the local high school were having this big football game, which so many people attended. And so, yeah, naturally that meant that there were a lot of customers coming in and out of the KFC. And working that evening, doing the closing shift, were three employees. Mary Tyler, Opie Hughes, and 
and Joey Johnson. So let's talk a little bit more about them, starting with Mary Tyler. So Mary Tyler was a 37-year-old woman. I believe she was the assistant manager of the Kilgall KFC, and she was a mother of three. She had three kids from a previous relationship. However, that relationship broke down, and she was a single mum for a while, working hard to provide for her kids, and sometimes struggling to make ends meet. Until eventually, she met a man named Billy Tyler, who was honestly described as being the love of Mary's life, and they married. And like Mary, Billy also had kids from a previous marriage. He had two children, so Mary became his children's stepmom. And with their five kids, they were obviously a family of seven, and a really happy family of seven too. Billy's children said that Mary was really just the best stepmother because she doted on them, and she loved them just as much as she loved her own kids. I mean, she did view Billy's children as her own. Mary just idolised her five children. She was always so proud of them. As I said, also working at the restaurant that evening was 39-year-old Opie Hughes. She was also married. Her husband's name was Jack Hughes, and they had two children together named Myra and Merle. Although, having said that, one source that I came across said that she had three children, um, but I couldn't find the name of a third. Opie was described as being a very kind-hearted woman and a devout wife and mother. And unfortunately, that was really the extent of the information that I could find online about Opie. As for Joey Johnson, the third employee on shift that night, he was 20 years old and a sophomore in college. And he was a very athletic young man, very much into sports, particularly martial arts. In high school, he was senior class president and he always had a very strong work ethic. He was a very determined young man, which apparently he got from his father. His father taught him to be very hardworking before he sadly passed away when Joey was young. After a very busy evening serving customers, Mary, Opie and Joey eventually closed the KFC restaurant for the night. I believed it closed at around 10pm and they were just doing their usual closing shift routine of, you know, cleaning the store, taking out the trash, getting it all ready for the next shift the following day. So everything seemed normal. It was just a normal Friday night closing shift. Or at least that was until 10.45pm when one of Mary Tyler's children, 17 year old Kimberly Tyler, arrived at the KFC restaurant to see her mum Mary. Now Kimberly actually also worked at the same restaurant. Mary had helped her daughter get a job there and she had been working earlier that evening. But Kimberly later returned even after her shift had ended because apparently she was going out with her boyfriend that night and she wanted to ask her mum Mary if she could borrow a little bit of money. So she went to the restaurant after it had closed expecting her mum and the other employees to be there cleaning up. However, when Kimberly got there, the front door to the restaurant was locked and when Kimberly peered in through the window, oddly she couldn't see anyone inside and so she walked around to the back of the store and found that the back door was open and when she walked inside she again found that no one was there. But Kimberly immediately noticed that the restaurant was not how it was usually left at the end of a shift, it was in disarray almost. So for starters she noticed in the kitchen that there were like utensils and pots and pans and some flour just scattered across the floor. An employee hat was just discarded on the floor and Kimberly also noticed blood. There was blood on the floor in the kitchen too. Not a huge amount of blood, it was more like patches of blood or spots of blood in a couple of different areas. So it seemed as though something had happened, some kind of altercation. So straight away, Kimberly contacted her stepfather, Mary's husband, Billy, to ask if her mum was at home, but she wasn't. She hadn't returned home from work yet. And soon Billy arrived at the restaurant too, because he became very concerned about his wife when Kimberly told him about the state that the restaurant had been left in, thinking that the blood on the floor might have been the result of some kind of accident. You know, maybe Mary or one of the other employees working the closing shift had cut themselves or something. Kimberly and Billy Tyler immediately started contacting local hospitals to ask if any KFC workers had been brought in that night, but they hadn't. No hospital had any record of them. And so, fearing the worst, Kimberly and Billy contacted the Kilgore police. When police arrived at the scene, they soon established who was actually working at the restaurant that night during the closing shift. It was obviously Mary Tyler, Opie Hughes, and Joey Johnson. And they knew this because 
their time cards were still there and they hadn't clocked out yet and also all of their vehicles were still there parked outside of the restaurant which of course kind of raised alarm bells even more the fact that all three were nowhere to be seen and yet their cars had just been abandoned at the restaurant could that mean that Mary, Opie and Joey had been abducted by someone and they took them away in their vehicle of course the police observed the blood at the scene they noticed the fact that utensils and flour and a hat was scattered across the floor suggesting perhaps a struggle and in addition to that they noticed that the cash register was completely empty all of the money had been taken out of it so this indicated a possible motive as to whatever had happened here was this a robbery or something but before the investigation even really began then came the realization that mary opie and joey were not actually the only people missing from the restaurant that night literally just as the police were getting started with their investigation they were approached by a young woman named lana maxwell who informed the police that her husband was also missing. Her husband was a man named David Maxwell. He was 20 years old. He also worked at the Kilgore KFC, although he wasn't working that evening. And he was very good friends with Joey Johnson. They had gone to school together and they were in the same fraternity in college. And David was a father-to-be. His partner Lana was pregnant with their first child at the time that this case occurred. So it was a very exciting time in his life. And on the night of the 23rd of September, David Maxwell had left his home and he headed to KFC with another friend of his, 19-year-old Monty Landers. And the reason for this was because apparently, according to a book I read about this case, David and Joey were sharing a motorbike and David knew that Joey would be needing the motorbike when he finished work that evening. So he and Monty took it to the KFC and they waited in the restaurant for Joey to finish his shift. I think they were all going to hang out afterwards. Monty Landers, by the way, was 19 years old and he was also a fraternity brother of David and Joey's. He was said to have been a very gentle spirited young man who loved the outdoors. He too loved karate and martial arts like Joey and David. He loved sports cars and the rodeo and his dream was to become a forest ranger one day. That was his dream career. And yeah, as I said, Monty and David were in the restaurant waiting for Joey that night and now here was David's wife Lana telling the police that David never came home. Home. So it seemed as though five people were missing from the restaurant. Mary Tyler, Opie Hughes, Joey Johnson, David Maxwell and Monty Landers. So the search for the missing five quickly got underway. The Texas Rangers were called in and sources state that locals volunteered to help join the search too. And they were searching all through the night trying to find any trace of them or anything which could indicate where they might have gone. But it wouldn't be until the following morning when their whereabouts would finally be discovered when a member of the public stumbled upon a truly gruesome scene. On the morning of the 24th of September 1983, about 12 miles away from the restaurant, a man named Arthur Warlick, who was an oil field worker in Russ County, was about to start work for the morning in one of the fields where he worked when all of a sudden he spotted a couple of people lying on the ground in the field near the road. Now Arthur assumed initially that these people were probably probably teenagers and that they were sleeping. Maybe they'd had a party or something in the field the previous evening. They were drinking alcohol and they just fell asleep. And so he started shouting to them, telling them to get up and leave, but none of them moved. And so he started walking closer towards them and that was when he realized that these people, these four people were not sleeping. They were actually dead. So Arthur immediately contacted the police who were quickly at the scene and were soon able to establish that the deceased had of course all been victims of homicide. There was one woman and three men and they were all lying face down on the ground side by side and they'd each been shot mainly in the neck and in the back of the head and in the back a couple of times. I think they'd each sustained a couple of gunshot wounds. It was as if they'd all just been lined up and shot execution style and of course the police knew immediately who these victims 
victims were. It was the missing KFC employees who had disappeared the evening before. In fact, a few of them were even wearing KFC uniforms. However, obviously we know that five people were missing from the restaurant and yet only four bodies had been found. They were the bodies of Joey Johnson, David Maxwell, Monty Landers and Mary Tyler. But what about Opie Hughes? She wasn't among the four bodies, so where was she? Well, it didn't take long for her body to be discovered too. Opie was found dead in an area about 14 yards away from the other four victims and she was also lying face down on the ground and she had been shot to death. And the police theorised at the time that the reason Opie was found away from the others was because perhaps she had tried to make a run for it. At some point she was able to escape the killer or killers and she just began running as fast as she could away from them. But tragically they caught up with her and she was killed too. And it was also quickly theorised that there must have been more than one killer here. Firstly because, I mean, obviously there were five victims so it seems pretty unlikely that just one person would have been able to overpower all of them and carry out this crime alone. But secondly because the bullets that had killed the victims were established to have been shot from at least two different guns. Possibly even three guns but definitely at least two. So that also indicated that there was more than one person responsible. So following the discovery of the bodies, the police began the search for evidence, which obviously started with the restaurant where the five victims had been abducted from. Now, some sources state that the Kilgore police made the huge mistake in the very beginning of this case of not securing the crime scene properly, the restaurant, for like a whole day, which, you know, could have meant that a load of the evidence that was in the restaurant may have been destroyed. But they eventually dusted the scene for fingerprints, they collected this KFC tape box, it was like a little cardboard box which the cash register tape was kept in and the police noticed that it had blood spatter on and as well as that they also collected this napkin which also had blood on it. But of course what you've got to remember is that this was 1983 and DNA and forensic science was in its infancy, it was barely a thing yet. So although they had this blood evidence, there wasn't really anything that they could do with it at the time which could bring them any closer to catching the murderers. But there was something else that was found in terms of evidence. It wasn't found in the restaurant but stuck in the waistband of Joey Johnson's jeans, the police discovered a fingernail. This like torn off fingernail which hadn't come from him, it wasn't one of his fingernails because none of his were torn. So the police started thinking that maybe this torn off fingernail belonged to one of the killers and that it had perhaps come off during a struggle. As I understand it, Joey Johnson had sustained the most gunshot wounds out of all of the victims, which suggested to the police that maybe he was the one who was trying to put up most of a fight. Who knows, maybe he tried to like wrestle the gun off one of the attackers or something and during this struggle he tore off one of their fingernails and it got caught in his waistband. So yeah, this fingernail was also collected as evidence in the hopes that maybe the police would later be able to compare it against any future suspects. And it wasn't long actually before the police had their first suspect in the case. It was a man named James Earl Mankins Jr. And interestingly, James Mankins Sr., his father, was actually a former state representative. In this case, father and son could not be more different because whilst James Mankins Sr. was a very respected individual with a very good high up job, his son was, well, the opposite really. He was known to the police. He'd been in trouble with the law many times before. I believe mainly for drug related offences. He was a drug dealer and apparently he could be quite a violent individual or at least he would go around threatening violence. Sources state that he would sometimes just go around threatening people. And according to reports, the police actually discovered that following the KFC massacre, as this case became known in the media, James Mankins Jr. had actually been going around and he'd been saying things to people like, don't cross me or you'll end up like the Kentucky Five. Almost like he was insinuating that he was the killer. So the police asked James Mankins to come down to the police station to be interviewed about the murders. This was on 
the 1st of October 1983, so about a week or so after the crime. The detectives asked James if he had any involvement in the killings, to which he said no, he denied having any part in them. However, it was during his interview when the police did notice that on James's right hand, his fingernail on his middle finger was missing. The tip of his fingernail was missing. It looked like it had been torn off, exactly like the fingernail that was recovered from Joey Johnson's clothing. And apparently he also had an injury on his right hand too. So of course for the police, this was an immediate red flag. And they asked James what happened to his fingernail and his hand. And he just said something like, oh, I just got it caught on something. With James's consent, the police took some pictures of his nail. They took some clippings of it. Apparently they even made this like plastic mold or cast of his finger to compare against the torn off nail found on Joey. So whilst all of that was going on, whilst that was in the lab, the police began looking into James's movements on the day that the killings took place to establish whether he had an alibi or not. It turns out that literally on the day that this case occurred, James Mankins had just been let out of jail for unlawfully carrying a weapon and a handgun and a rifle were taken off of him by the police. But what the detectives would discover is that after he was released from jail, James Mankins went and borrowed another gun from an acquaintance of his. And the gun that he borrowed on the day of the murders was a 38 caliber pistol. The same type of gun as one of the murder weapons that was used to shoot the five victims. And he returned this gun to his acquaintance just the day after the crime. So he borrowed it on the day of the murders and then gave it straight back the next day. So of course this looked very suspicious. The gun that he borrowed was collected and it was examined by a ballistics expert. However, they were unable to establish whether it was definitely the weapon that had been used in the murders. The expert basically said that it might have been the gun that was used, but it also might not have been. They didn't know. But I mean, despite that, for the police, it was yet another thing that pointed to James Mankins as being the killer. He was looking like a very viable suspect because of the gun, the fingernail, the fact that he'd allegedly made strange comments about the murders to people. And people started to theorise that maybe if James was the killer, his motive for carrying out the crime was drug related. We know that he was a drug dealer. And there were rumours going around following the murders that some of the staff who worked at that KFC in Kilgore were apparently selling drugs out of the drive through window. Although it was just that, a rumour. I don't believe it was ever confirmed to be true. There was another rumour going around that there was a secret drug recipe for methamphetamines hidden in the restaurant somewhere and that James Mankins wanted it. So perhaps he went to the restaurant that night armed with a gun intent on threatening the employees to give it to him and when they didn't or when they couldn't he decided to kill them. But the drugs theory wasn't the only one surrounding the motive in this case. One of the main theories was that this was a robbery, a robbery gone wrong. We know that all of the money was taken from the cash register, so perhaps whoever killed the five victims broke into the restaurant that night with just the intent to rob the place, but maybe they panicked. Maybe the victims saw the robbers' faces, and so they decided to murder them so that they wouldn't be able to identify them to the police later. And there was a witness who seemed to be able to back up this theory. You see, a woman came forward to the police claiming that she had been in the KFC restaurant earlier in the evening on the 23rd of September, so not long before the murders occurred, and she claimed that while she was in there, she overheard one of the female employees talking to someone on the phone about how there was roughly $2,000 in the till, in the cash register, which still needed to be taken to the bank. Now, some sources state that the female female employee on the phone was Mary Tyler's daughter, Kimberly. As we know, she also worked at that KFC with her mum and she had been working earlier that night. So it's stated that she was speaking to her mum, Mary, on the phone about the money in the cash register before Mary came in for her shift because obviously Mary Tyler was the assistant manager. And apparently she made this comment on the phone as she was standing right by the food counter. And the witness told 
the police that standing near the counter were these two men. Wow, some sources say there were two men, others say one, but they obviously also would have heard this comment about there being $2,000 in the cash register. So thinking that maybe those two men could have had something to do with the killings because maybe they decided to target the restaurant after closing time to steal the money, she contacted the police to give this account and she described to the detectives what these two men looked like. And it was as a result of this description when two new potential suspects emerged in the case. Two names which were actually already on a list of several others that the police intended to speak to as part of this investigation. Darnell Hartsfield and his cousin, Romeo Pinkerton. These men became of interest in the investigation because they matched the description of the men seen in the restaurant having overheard this phone call and because they too were known to the police. They were known criminals and in fact at the time that all of this was going on, the police were looking for Darnell Hartsfield. He was a wanted man and they had a warrant out for his arrest because just a couple of days after the KFC killings, he and a friend of his had carried out an armed robbery at a grocery store in the city of Tyler in Texas, which is only about 25 miles away from Kilgore. And the way that this crime was carried out seemed very similar to the KFC killings because Darnell and his accomplice targeted the store right at closing time when it was quiet and dark outside, just like in this case. They took all of the money from the cash registers and Darnell threatened the employee of the grocery store with a 38 caliber pistol. Again, just like one of the weapons that was used to shoot Mary, Opie, Joey, David and Monty. So the police were very keen to speak to these two cousins, Darnell and Romeo. So they began trying to locate them and they found Romeo Pinkerton first. They brought him in for questioning and asked him where he was on the night that the KFC murders occurred, to which he replied saying, well, I was in prison. He was in jail for some other crime that he had committed and he said that he only got out a few days after the murders so he claimed that he couldn't have been involved. As for Darnell Hartsfield when he was finally found and questioned in relation to this case he too denied being involved in the killings. The police had Darnell undergo a polygraph test which he passed and for the detectives at the time that kind of seemed to be enough to rule him out. I feel like back then polygraphs were thought to be a lot more precise than they are today. Today most people know that they are not really accurate at all in detecting lies. It's why they can't be used in a court of law as evidence. But due to this, due to the fact that Donnell passed the polygraph and Romeo Pinkerton's alibi of being in prison and also just the lack of evidence, the two men, Donnell Hartsfield and Romeo Pinkerton, were more or less ruled out of this homicide inquiry. They were no longer considered suspect. Although they were both soon back in prison anyway, Darnell for the armed robbery of the Tyler grocery store and Romeo for some other crime that he had committed. Following this, the police continued looking into other people of interest and the case was all over the news in the very beginning, which resulted in countless tips and leads coming in, but for the most part, they were just dead ends, unfortunately. But the detectives working the case still very much suspected James Mankins Jr. as being the killer. They really believed that he was the one responsible, but they just didn't have the solid evidence to prove it. I mean, they had the fingernail evidence, but the issue with this appeared to be that different experts seem to have different opinions. According to the book that I read about this case, some experts would look at the torn fingernail that had been found on Joey Johnson and they would compare it to James Mankin's nails or the plastic cast that had been previously made of his fingernail. And they would say, yep, that is a match. That nail had to have come from him. Whereas other experts would disagree and they didn't think that it looked like a match. And obviously this was before the time when DNA technology could tell you whether it was a definitive match. So yeah, although the police really suspected him, there was nowhere near enough evidence to be able to charge him and take him to trial. And so sadly, over the years, the case of the Kilgore KFC massacre remained unsolved and it went cold. And there was no justice for the five victims who lost their lives that night in such a brutal way and no closure for their families. Over the years, the victims' families continuously tried to get the case reopened and around the 10 year anniversary, so in September of 1993, it was. And it was taken over by Texas Attorney General Dan Morales. 
it was hoped that now, a decade on, they might be able to use the latest advancements in DNA and forensic science to finally crack the case. And so the fingernail evidence was sent off for testing. It was sent to this lab in Dallas. And the results came back that the DNA from this torn off fingernail was consistent with James Mankins. So it wasn't an exact match. It was just labeled as consistent. And it seemed as though for the police, this was enough. They believed that they now had enough to finally charge James Mankins with the five KFC murders. And so that's exactly what they did. James Mankins was indicted and he pleaded not guilty to the crime. And so it was looking like Mankins was headed to trial. However, before the trial began, as both sides, as the defense and the prosecution were, you know, building their cases, the prosecution were confronted with a massive blow. You see, in an attempt to make their case against James Mankins even stronger, they decided to send off the nail evidence once again for testing, this time to the Armed Forces Institute for Pathology, which were considered to be the most, like, state-of-the-art crime lab who could carry out more sophisticated and reliable DNA tests, I suppose. The prosecution hoped that they would send the fingernail off to them and get a more definitive match to James Mankin so that there would be no doubt in the jury's minds that he was the murderer. However, this majorly backfired because upon conducting these tests, the DNA analyst revealed that James Mankin's fingernail was not a match. It was 100% not James Mankin's fingernail that had been found in Joey Johnson's waistband. So as you can imagine, this practically made the prosecution's case against James Mankin's crumble. The fingernail was really the only solid evidence they had linking him to the crime, and now they didn't even have that. James Mankin's was innocent, innocent of this crime anyway, and so the charges against him were dropped before the trial even began, and he was release. And I have a quote here from James Mankins Jr. after the charges were dropped. He said, 100% I'm innocent and I resent even the question. The worst part was the six months in jail over there, thinking about being put to death for something I didn't do. And more than likely, if it weren't for that DNA, I would have been on death row. So that was that. Mankins was not the killer and the police were, I guess, right back where they started. If Mankins wasn't guilty of this massacre, then who was? Who were the murderers? Murderers. Although, having said that, despite the lack of evidence against him, people still wholeheartedly believed that Mankins was responsible. In fact, there were rumours going around that his father, State Representative James Mankins Sr., was part of this big cover-up. He had connections to be able to cover up what his son had done and get the charges against him dropped, which was ludicrous, ludicrous rumours, but some people really believe them. Tragically, following Mankin's release, the case went cold once again, but still the families constantly campaigned for it to be revisited and reviewed, and I think around 2000, 2001 time, it was reopened once again, so this was about 17 years after the murders, and of course, again, by this point, there were even more developments and advancements in forensic technology, so as part of this new investigation, the new team assigned to this case took all of the old evidence related to the case out of storage and decided to send it off for new testing just to see what they could find. So this included the KFC tape box which had blood spatter on and a napkin which had traces of blood on it. Both of which if you remember were discovered on the floor of the KFC restaurant on the night that the murders occurred and when they were sent off for testing, would you believe it, scientists discovered something. They had a breakthrough because a match was found. They found a match to the blood from the KFC tape box on the CODIS database and it was to Darnell Hartsfield. But the DNA breakthroughs didn't end there when the napkin was sent off for testing. The blood from that was found to have been a match to none other than Hartfield's cousin, Romeo Pinkerton. Darnell Hartsfield and Romeo Pinkerton, the men who were considered suspects in the case pretty much right in the very beginning, but were more or less ruled out, mainly because it seemed as though Romeo Pinkerton had an alibi for that night. If you recall from earlier, he told the police in the 
original investigation that he couldn't have been the killer because he was still in prison on the night that the KFC massacre took place. It wasn't until a few days later when he was actually released, but as it would turn out, that was a lie. Romeo had lied. He'd actually been released a few days before the murders, not a few days after. And from what I can gather, the reason the police just missed this at the time was because of a hurricane that had happened in Texas a couple of weeks before the murders. I think it was called Hurricane Alicia. Because of all of the chaos in the aftermath of that, it meant that it was harder for the police to properly check like prison records and stuff. I don't know. But yeah, the police just didn't realise at the time that this was a lie from Pinkerton. He was out of jail at the time of the murders and so did have the opportunity to commit this crime alongside his cousin. I mean, it seemed as though the KFC killers were right in front of the police's eyes all these years. However, it would appear as though they were not the only ones. You see, as part of this new investigation, something else that was sent off for testing was Opie Hughes's underwear, because when it was taken out of storage, the detective spotted some discoloration in her underwear, which had previously gone unnoticed by the original detectives back in 1983. And when this was tested, it was found that this discoloration was semen, semen which did not match Opie's husband, indicating that Opie had tragically been raped on the night that she was killed, which now made a lot more sense to the police as to why she was found in an area away from the other four victims. I mentioned earlier that initially it was theorised that the reason why Opie's body was in another spot, like 14 yards away, was because she had tried to make a run for it. But now they believed that that probably wasn't the case. They believed that she was probably singled out and taken to this area where she was sexually assaulted before she was shot to death. But would you believe it? The semen found in Opie's underwear was not a match to either Darnell Hartsfield or Romeo Pinkerton. So there must have been a third killer. Darnell and Romeo must have had another accomplice. The DNA profile of the third attacker was compared to James Mankins, just in case he really was involved. But of course, it didn't match, confirming once for all that he wasn't. They also searched the CODIS database, again no matches, and they tested the DNA against about 180 men that they thought could have potentially been involved, but nothing. But despite not having the third match, the police didn't want to wait any longer to apprehend and prosecute Hartsfield and Pinkerton. The families of the victims had already been waiting so many years for justice, they couldn't wait much longer. And so in November of 2005, the cousins were both arrested and charged with five counts of capital murder each. The murders of Mary Tyler, Opie Hughes, David Maxwell, Joey Johnson and Monty Landers. Just wanted to briefly divert back to the fingernail quickly before we discuss their court proceedings. But after all that fiasco with the former detectives wholeheartedly believing that the torn off fingernail found in Joey Johnson's waistband had to have come from James Mankin, it turns out that it had actually come from one of the other victims. I think DNA eventually established that the torn fingernail was Mary Tyler's. So the police spent so much time trying to build their case against Mankins based on a fingernail which had literally just come from one of the other victims. But yeah, anyway, carrying on. Now, Romeo Pinkerton, when it came to his trial, he actually decided to plead guilty. He made a deal with prosecutors and agreed to plead guilty to his charges so long as the death penalty was taken off the table. And so instead he received five concurrent life sentences and he was sent to a prison in Wichita Falls in Texas. But despite his guilty plea, he still denies having a part in the murders to this day. He said that he only pleaded guilty to avoid the death penalty, but he remains adamant that he is innocent, claiming that he was essentially set up by the police because of racism he claimed that racist cops planted the evidence. They planted his DNA on the napkin, which, I mean, seems pretty impossible because we know that the bloody napkin was recovered from the restaurant on the night that the murders occurred back in 1983 when, as I said, DNA technology was barely a thing. DNA testing at this point was an incredibly new and basic concept that the police didn't really know much about yet. So how could officers have
have known that somehow planting Pinkerton's DNA on this napkin would incriminate him later if they didn't really know anything about DNA, if that makes sense. I'm not really sure if I worded that in the best way, but hopefully you get where I'm coming from. As for Darnell Hartsfield, he did the opposite to his cousin and he pleaded not guilty and he went to trial in 2008 with the prosecution presenting the jury their theorised version of events, what they believed happened all those years ago on the night of the Kilgore KFC massacre. So they believed that on the evening of the 23rd of September 1983, Hartsfield and Pinkerton and possibly a third man were in the KFC restaurant when they overheard that phone call made by one of the female employees about how there was $2,000 in the cash register which needed to be taken to the bank. And as soon as they heard this phone call, they decided to conduct a robbery, rob the place once the restaurant had closed for the night and steal all of this money. So later that evening, Hartsfield, Pinkerton and the third attacker returned after closing time whilst the staff were tidying and cleaning up. And it's thought that they confronted Joey Johnson around the back of the restaurant whilst he was taking out the trash bag. They threatened Joey with their guns, forced him back inside of the store and proceeded to threaten the other four people in there, Mary, Opie, David and Monty. They took the money from the cash register. It was clear that some kind of struggle had taken place due to the cutlery and pots and pans being scattered on the floor and the blood that was found. And for some reason, the three men decided that they were going to abduct the five victims and take them elsewhere rather than, you know, just leaving them alive in the restaurant and taking off with the money. Perhaps, again, they panicked because there were five people here that could give the police a description of the robbers and they just decided that they couldn't risk that. They were going to have to kill them, otherwise they would get caught. And so they transported the five to that oil field about 12 miles away from the restaurant and there they lined them up and they executed them. And we obviously know that OP was taken away and raped by the third unidentified attacker and shot too. When Darnell Hartsfield's trial came to an end, the jury announced that they had found him guilty of all five capital murder charges and he was given five consecutive life sentences. However, he only spent about 14 years in prison for this crime before he died. According to online articles, Darnell Hartsfield died of natural causes while still in jail in May of 2022. At the time of his death, he was about 61 years old. As for his cousin, Romeo Pinkerton, I believe he is still in prison to this day, still protesting his innocence. And as for the third perpetrator, he has still never been found. The man who raped Opie has never been brought to justice. Over the years, Opie Hughes's family have literally begged Pinkerton and Hartsfield to please give over the name of the third killer, but they never have. And so he has never been apprehended, which is just awful because it took so long, about 25 years to get Hartsfield and Pinkerton behind bars for this crime. And yet more than four and a half decades later, this case is only really half solved if you think about it because the police have never been able to identify the third killer. According to a documentary that I watched about this case, investigators are still trying to find the third killer to this day. They are still trying to find a match to his DNA profile, but as of April 2024, he still hasn't been apprehended. I wonder if maybe they're currently trying to use familial DNA techniques to narrow down the search for him to find potential relatives because I mean we've seen how successful that has been in other cold cases before haven't we? Hopefully they will identify the third murderer soon enough and if he's still alive he will be brought to justice and I guess I'll keep you guys updated on that. I'll let you guys know if there are any further developments. But yeah that is it for this case that concludes the case of the Kilgore KFC massacre, the murders of Mary Tyler, Opie Hughes, Joey Johnson, David Maxwell and Monty Landers. A cold case that was eventually solved thanks to the advancements in DNA and forensic technology. I would say that these are definitely amongst some of my favourite cases to cover. Of course as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case down below in the comments. I would love to hear what you guys think and feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. They can be solved cases, unsolved cases, serial killer cases, you name it. Again, you can pop them in the comments below or alternatively, I do have a case request form linked in the description box too if you would prefer to go through that. Thank
thank you all so much for watching please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you again next week for another mystery with molly bye